A podcast. What is the word? A podcast by Kaluga. A podcast. No. By Kaluga. Yeah. Hi, I'm Christy, and in this episode of Today We Tried, we're talking all about the pelvic floor a group of 28 muscles that you've probably heard about but might be a little intimidated by or not fully understand. Not to worry. Our guests today are experts in the pelvic floor and committed to normalizing talking about it. They share so many gems that will make you rethink pelvic floor health. For example, they share why doing Kegels might actually be the opposite of what you need and why you can learn so much about your pelvic floor from your posture. And don't worry, you'll also learn way more about me and my pelvic floor than you probably want to know. If you're new here, oversharing is sort of a theme. (laughs) We shared an excerpt with my conversation with Drs. Clark and Fisher back in episode three, and I'm so excited to share our full chat now. So let's get started. I am here with Dr. Amanda Fisher and Dr. Morgan Clark. They are both physical therapists specialized in pelvic health and owners of Empower Your Pelvis. They treat both females and males because everyone has a pelvic floor. Patients coming into their clinic are typically experiencing pelvic pain, bladder issues, bowel issues, low back and SI dysfunction, pain with sex, prolapse, among many other things that are pelvic health related. So excited to chat with you both. How are you doing? Yes. Thank you for having us. Yes, we're doing well. Thank you. I would love to just start. I know this is like a really big question, but I feel like people just don't realize how much is connected to your pelvic floor health. For me, I come to this from the perspective of someone with a long journey with IBS with constipation. I've now had four babies, so my pelvic floor has been through quite a bit. And I think I didn't realize until entering this world, how important your pelvic floor is to your overall health and well-being. Could you share a little bit about why it's so important to be focused on pelvic floor health? Again, thank you for having us. And we, our mission is to normalize pelvic health. Like you're saying, um, most of our patients coming in here are not aware that they have a pelvic floor or never have heard of their pelvic floor that knew something they could do about it, which would be doing pelvic floor physical therapy. But the importance is we tell patients so many times people come in and they think their pelvic floor is just for their urinary system or bowel system or oh, sex and have babies. But we tell them all the time, we see this in our runners, we see dysfunction in your pelvic floor and our day-to-day, you know, workers in a in a factory moving things back and forth. This very the pelvic floor is very functional and it helps you with standing and breathing and walking and running and stairs and all those things, bending and lifting. That I think if we can also understand that it works with your whole entire body and not just pee poop and sex, I think people will be like, Oh, well, maybe I should go get that checked out. Well, I learned from your amazing Instagram where you guys have awesome videos really that are funny and clever and super informative at the same time that there are 28 muscles in your pelvic floor. (laughs) Is that right? That is right. Correct. Blew my mind. Like you have no idea. And if you think about I'm I'm a runner or used to be a runner and then like slowly working my way back. I know that if one muscle, like when I'm running, is kind of weaker, I'll overcompensate with something else. So I assume it's like a similar thing in your pelvic floor. Things can get out of whack really quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why like the interesting thing when things are going on with your knee, like say you're running and you have knee pain, you go see a specialist and they're like, okay, go to physical therapy to really find what the missing piece is. But with pelvic floor, kind of how you said with your midwife, like, it's like, okay, you have pelvic floor issues and that's that. Like, let's give it a year and see what happens. Like, hey, these are muscles. We rehab other tissue in multi-directions like we would with a runner. We just wouldn't send you in forward facing. We'd start going like lateral movements out to the side or behind your back. And that's what we need to be doing with the pelvic floor too. It moves in so many different ranges of motions that if we could start thinking like, you rehab your knee, do this. Let's rehab the pelvic floor and get you back sooner without compensating for a year postpartum. Like let's fix this thing early. So we're, when you get back into running, you're not going to be dealing with pelvic floor dysfunction, like peeing your pants or, oh my gosh, no, I'm feeling pressure down there because I started running too soon and my pelvic floor wasn't ready for it. 
or diastasis recti. Like now my abdominals are, you know, way more separated than they were when I gave birth. Why is that happening? We need to make sure those muscles are communicating well together so we don't have that overcompensation creating more dysfunction down the road. And at the end of the day, these are a group of muscles. Like you already said, there's 28 of them. If you can start thinking, okay, this is just muscle tissue, like this muscle tissue in my shoulder or my knee or my hips, I think people would understand it's not this like, oh, like pelvic floor kind of thing. I'm like, it's just muscles. They're, we're just rehabbing like we would anywhere else, like Amanda was saying. The other challenge is, like I said, my midwife was like, oh yeah, you have no pelvic floor at this point. You've had four babies, no. whatever. <laughs> but no, but that, and it was kind of like, oh, well, it is what it is. Sometimes it's presented that way of, oh, these are just, this is what happens with pregnancy. This is what happens postpartum. We're maybe conditioned as women, especially to just deal with it. Oh, this is normal. Like, I think there's so many things with pregnancy and postpartum that the answer is, oh, that's normal and not, yeah, that's normal, but we can also make it better. We can solve that problem. There isn't that next step. And that's what you guys are doing. Exactly. Like we get that message on, I feel like Instagram a lot with, Hey, I'm dealing with pubic symphysis pain, you know, with pregnancy. And my doctor just said, this is something I'm going to have for the next couple of months as I'm moving through growing this baby. And we're like, okay, typical thing with pubic symphysis dysfunction is boom, boom, boom. Like we want to look at abdominals, inner thighs, what's mobility like? Because The pelvis and the front there doesn't like a lot of mobility. So when you're getting it shifting as your abdominal muscles are growing, like there's a lot of stuff that we can focus on and retrain. And we see a lot of improvement postpartum when our pregnant women start tackling, you know, retraining the system early because you're not prepping just for that baby or women are, but it's a marathon. So how are you training for that marathon? Are you training to have a sprained ankle at the end, which would be just normal childbirth? Are you going to have like a broken ankle, which sounds so dramatic now that I'm saying it, but like would be like a cesarean delivery or a grade four, grade three tear. That's going to take a little bit more of a recovery than just a sprained ankle. And then that fourth trimester is the walk after the marathon. Are you going to be really sore? Are you going to be dehydrated? Like We know, we've seen enough pregnant women that it's a really smart idea to start training and prepping the tissue early on. And then, hey, guess what? You just injured the tissue. Let's get you back in physical therapy to retrain it. So as you're holding that little kettlebell and like of a baby, and then you've got the toddler that you've probably just saved from running out in the street, and then your other toddlers you're pushing in the stroller, there's a lot of different kettlebell weights that you're shifting with your body that we need to make sure you're functioning well with your pelvic floor postpartum because moms do that. You can't tell a mom not to be a mom for six to eight weeks. They are doing that. And that's where we love to see our patients like at two weeks virtually or in clinic, really focusing on mobility with the pelvic floor, retraining the system so that that can work well for you down the road. Yeah. So I saw you talk about, and you've been talking about a focus on mobility before strengthening. Could you just explain a little bit the distinction between those two as you're thinking about pelvic floor health? The big thing is people think Kegels and a Kegel is a contraction of the pelvic floor. And majority of the patients that we see in the clinic are typically already high tone. So I don't know if there's going to be a video with this, but like their arm would be like contracted all the way up. That's a high tone arm. That would be a high tone pelvic floor. We want the motion, like an arm can move through a flexion and a contraction, (laughs) just like your pelvic floor, because their muscles, they should be able to contract all the way up, relax all the way back down. But eight to nine out of 10 patients that we see in our clinic are typically coming in contracted and they've lost that mobility to relax it down or lengthen the tissue out. So the pelvic floor is not going to work well when it's not moving through a full range of motion. This is something that 80% of our job is just education because so many times when we tell people this, they're like, well, I've been working on my Kegels and it's not better, or I've been doing this and that. And then we're telling them, actually, your muscles are a little bit too restricted or they're not moving like they should. I can't tell you the faces we get like, what? Huh? And I would say, I can't remember. There's some research study that said if 10 women were given a handout on Kegels at their gynecology um, appointment or OB or wherever. I think like six out of the 10 or seven out of the 10 
do not do them correctly. And so that's a really big percentage then coming into our clinic. Then we see them, we get them on the table, we're checking this muscle tissue. So many people are bearing down or they only contract some of the muscles or they're really just like rectally doing it and that vaginal area isn't. And I think the other thing too is with our patients who have vaginal deliveries, they're like, oh, it's just so stretched out down there now. I had a baby and I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> like It's like a whiplash injury. Whoa. Some of those muscles are like, what the just happened down there, right? So they freak out and tightened up. I like to call those like our type A personalities. They want to help out all the time. They're never letting go. When we're doing an internal exam, it's like, whoa, sister, let it go. You've been like working out all day, every day. And then you go to another muscle and he's like on vacation, you know, no tone there. So our job is to really get those to communicate as a team, like a team approach to those 28 muscles down there. Because if only five or six of them are working really well, they're going to be high and tight while the rest of them are back sipping margaritas. So get them together, make them all be on a full range of motion together, and then build them up with their besties, the lower core, the glutes, and things typically go a-okay. Well, that is, it's how you think about muscles and other parts of your body that just needs to be applied to pelvic floor too. I feel like it's a dark room down here. Like, you know, you go through your stages of life where we're like, don't, don't think about sex. Don't have sex. You know, you're in school, don't have sex. That, so you kind of put these blinders on and then women finally come in and they want to have sex or they're having issues. And they're still like, I can look at myself down there. Are you sure? Like I get a mirror, like, are you crazy? that we're starting to like peel back all these onion layers and be like, no, these are muscles. There's nothing bad about it. We look at our arm, we look at our legs and our ankles. We need to be looking at that tissue too. I don't know. You don't get the message around pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum, like that it actually is empowering or like you're using these muscles and it's something that it, you have control over or you can be a part of. Sometimes it's presented as something that's happening to you and like out of control and you have no agency there. But I think a focus on pelvic floor health is, okay, you can feel better. You can feel in control. You can, everything can be working for you and your body together. And that's, I think, just not the message you get as you're going through a pregnancy and childbirth. I think it, this is another way to feel prepared and empowered going into labor and then in going through the postpartum period. I actually can feel better because it's embarrassing if you're like leaking or you feel self-conscious. You know, you should actually enjoy sex post having a baby. It shouldn't be painful, but I don't think you hear that enough. No, definitely not. And I mean, we try to shift our patients' minds from, oh, it's normal. My best friend has this issue or it's normal. This is supposed to happen to more of a, it's common just because if we always put these things in our brain as normal, I tend to see patients be kind of like, well, maybe it'll just get better. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Rather than be like, yes, it's common to have a separation of your tummy after childbirth, but can we rehab it and make it better? Like you're saying, it is empowering to give patients that tool to get better and progress. But the other thing about muscles in general, anywhere in the body, is it's usually not like a quick fix. Now, there are sometimes we see patients in here that we have to tweak a couple things movement wise to help with pressure or something, and they'll walk out being like, oh, that's so much better. But muscle tightness or just general weakness, it's not like, okay, hey, um, you should be already be feeling better. We, we've been through 45 minutes of therapy. It's just like if you went to see a personal trainer. You wouldn't think, oh, I went to one personal training session and now I'm ready to do a Olympic weightlifting competition, right? It's the same thing. So trying to get people to understand like there, this is a process depending on where we start. And a lot of times we get patients who, you know, who've had multiple deliveries or have had these issues, even if it's not related to having a baby for 20 years. And they're like, well, when am I going to get better? I'm like, well, I just met you 15 minutes ago. So <laughs> So we have to give it a little time. This stuff has been going on for a while and we've got to figure out ways to break these patterns and habits and make your body more functional. One of my issues for sure is ab separation. So I've had four babies in five years, including a twin pregnancy, truly just have no muscle at all, like in my core or my back. And I'm really, I'm feeling it now. I think the other thing we do is just you kind of put it out of your mind and you kind of deal with it for long enough. Once you start paying attention, you're like, okay, eventually I have to start on the path of fixing this. 
So your pelvic floor, when it moves full, through its full range of motion, and you can even feel this as you breathe, you take a breath in, your, pul your belly expands, your pelvic floor expands or lengthens. As you blow out, your pelvic floor recoils, but so does your belly. Your pelvic floor and belly co-contract. So when you do, instead of a Kegel, we like to say trying to pick up a blueberry with your vagina or sucking a smoothie up down there. When you do that, you should probably feel a little bit in that lower abdomen. If not, no big deal. We can work on that. But when you feel that, those abs are what is first stretched and they're stretched for that nine months. They don't go back after postpartum, after the pregnancy. So you have to retrain brain, body connection, reconnecting the dots and getting those back. Then you get pregnant again. They're stretched again. So now they've been stretched 18 months, 27 months if you've had three pregnancies. And if we haven't tapped into that, it's going to take a longer time to co-contract. We've got our obliques on the sides that get nice and tight. So they're stretching and pulling into the back, which creates some low back tightness and tension. The front six-pack muscles continue to lengthen. The lower abs aren't contracting. So then we're just kind of staying lengthened. Posture plays a role in it, how we're holding our babies, lifting car seats, laundry around the house. Um, it's a lot of reconnecting dots and more often throughout the day. So if you were a knee injury, what I like to think about it is you would work on like quad sets, trying to get the top of the quad to really co-contract. And you would do that multiple times a day with like an ACL injury or a knee replacement. I like to think of the lower abs and the pelvic floor, more lower abs kind of reconnecting, zipping up from the base to the top, doing that more often throughout the day, activating the tissue, trying to remind it to work. The zipper being connected from your pubic bone up to your breastbone. The first part of the base of that zipper is picking up that blueberry, sucking up that smoothie. Second part of the zipper is connecting hip bone to hip bone, so those lower abs. The next part of that zipper to continue up to the breastbone is connecting up to the breastbone. So those are your upper abs. And that's how we look for them to contract. It should be pelvic floor first, lower abs second, transverse abdominis. Then your six pack and your obliques can join in the fun. But if your six pack and obliques join first, it creates this tension up top and pushes the pressure down, creating that little mommy pooch. When you lay down, it may look like a little alien is trying to pop out of your belly when you get up. That's a poor <laughs> contracted abdomen. It's reconnecting the dots with the brain. Like, okay, what it's been used to doing is connecting those obliques. So as I get up, the obliques are pulling tight, which creates that looseness in the six pack. So it looks, the pressure's coming out the belly, making it look like an alien popping out. So in my brain, I'm going to blow out because I know the breath, when I blow out, it recoils my pelvic floor and my lower belly. And I'm going to think a zip up as I come to lift my head up like a crunch. And then we start to reconnect the belly. So that can be an easy way. Like if I know I'm going to get out of bed to go get one of the kids in the middle of the night, I'm going to blow out, zip up as I'm going or roll to my side, but start training it that way. Then when you're going to lift that kettlebell baby, that 10 pound baby, you're going to zip it up as you go to stand too. blow out, reconnect the dots. If we don't, that's when we continue to have that separation lengthening. I've got a C-section group of women right now. So we go five days a week. By three and a half weeks, and this is them committed, they're in a community, I'm showing up Monday through Friday. Finally, by three and a half weeks, one of the ladies was like, I'm finally noticing a difference. So it's not like it happens overnight. And then slowly- And that's with consistency. Consistency. And, then, and this is like 15 minute routines of me working with them. By the fourth week, all of them were like, finally, it's connecting. Like I understand the zip up. So that's four and a half weeks so into it. We're now into 16 weeks with these ladies just because they've seen consistency. They continue to see change. And they're like, I ain't going back. Like things have been, and these are like moms who have had three and four kids that are in this group because it takes longer. And we know that because they've been stretched more often. It's really helpful to have that kind of visual, but also to think about the brain body connection. So you're also in that process, you're trying to retrain your muscles, but also your brain then to like, that's what it will know to do without you having to go through each step. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We're trying to make it to where that's when you engage your core through your daily activities. Cause I think a lot of people are like, Oh, I have this separation. I need to do 10 reps of this exercise and then 25 of this. And I'm like, Okay, that may be good, but it's not realistic for most people to have time to do that. 
but you you require your core to turn on for you a lot throughout the day. And you're not always requiring it to be at 100%. Your body's trying to adapt to the load you're putting on it. And so if you're like, okay, it's requiring me to pick up my 10 pound baby, that looks different than if I go deadlift 200 pounds, right? Your core will engage differently. And the whole point of it is, can we learn how to coordinate it appropriately? So we've got lots of women coming in here being like, my core is weak. I need to strengthen it. That's my goal. I had two this morning that actually came in and I was like, we're actually going to re-coordinate your core. And they're like, huh? You know, and that's what we're talking about. Trying to make sure a lot of times their core muscles actually feel pretty good strength wise. They just can't coordinate well with each other with your breath and the pelvic floor. And so once they learn that that motion and doing it, then I could see them doing it, picking up their carrier to come into my room and doing all those things. And it just looks so much better. But it is a hard habit to retrain. This is not like Amanda was saying with her patients and coaches, same with mine. It does take time, but we have to get away from this. Like I have a two finger separation or my doctor looked and it's four finger. And we're like, Let's not worry about that separation. Let's worry about how we're moving. And because you can close it functionally, but it can open back up if you just do, you could do a good squat and a bad squat, have one finger diastasis with one squat. And then if you do a bad squat, I'm going to put that in quotations and have a three finger diastasis just because the way you're moving and breathing and positioning yourself. I think giving that is also empowering people like, oh my gosh, I see a change just by changing my movement pattern. I do feel like what I've gotten is just a real, like a focus on how many fingers separation it is. But what I recall from past post six week appointments is that if it's only like one finger separation, like it's not a big deal, but if it's more than two to three, I think that's, oh, oh, that's normal, like full stop. You just have to deal with that now. But but everybody's abdomen is different too. We've got women in here that come in and they have a one finger diastasis and they are like, I can't do the things I did and it's causing me back pain and I can't pick my pelvic floor. But then we've got women here that have like six, seven fingers. They're like, I have that. So it's very like patient dependent too and what you compensate, not compensate with. So I think that whole like objective number of fingers is not a good way and not a good thing to put in people's heads. If you are doing things too soon, like I know for me, I'm running and I probably shouldn't because I feel like pressure, but I also need to clear my head. So I'm trying to, <laughs> maybe I can get into yoga. I like what sort of things, if you're postpartum, would you recommend kind of trying to avoid till you get a handle on your pelvic floor health? If you're having symptoms of pressure, leakage, pelvic pain, um, for any of our newer moms, like the bleeding, hip pain, I would maybe not stop running, but see if you're running 30 minutes and you're having those symptoms, what does it feel like if I run 15 minutes and I stop because running's moving your pelvic floor, but you're also testing the endurance, um, endurance level, but also the amount of pressure that you're putting through. It's like 10 to 12 times your body weight as you're running. Walking doesn't have that 10 to 12 times the body weight, but it also builds endurance, but it's still moving pelvic floor. So you can run for 15 minutes, just completely stop for anywhere for like 15 to 60 seconds. See if you can run a little bit more without having those symptoms. Or You can also offset that with walking program and maybe you go walk for 30 minutes and you have no pressure. Perfect. Let's go walking up hills, down hills. How is that going to, how does that feel? Does that trigger anything in the pelvic floor? But then there's also, since that's like one direction, we want to look at that pelvic floor laterally, eccentrically, meaning how are the glutes working with our pelvic floor? There's a lot of different exercises that we have patients do, but Like you, like as a runner, if somebody was probably like, you need to stop running, you'd be like, yeah, no, I can't. Like, that's my stress reliever. I've got to keep up with that. So we really want to work with our patients on what can we do. We just had a Chicago marathoner in here and she came in in June and she was peeing her pants with running. And she was like, I can't stop. I've already signed up for this marathon. I was like, okay, then this is what we're going to do. X, Y, Z. She just completed her Chicago marathon last week no leakage and she didn't stop for the bathroom once. And so we didn't have her stop running. We just added some other things in for full strengthening. And again, she did have to do a little run, stop, run, stop, run, stop for us to be able to build that back up. I love that you're though meeting your patients where they're at. What are your goals? How can we help you instead of being like, no, there's only one path here to pelvic floor health. 
Yes. We, and that, I think that's our basis around anything. Like we, if it's lifting, great, we're going to do that, but let's look at form first without any weight. And then let's look at the weight with your baby. And then sister, why are you lifting 300 pounds if we can't lift your 25 pound toddler? So it's, it is a lot of like, it might be some hard conversations, but our ultimate goal is to help you achieve your goal. So how can we do that? What else do we need to add in knowingly that you have a very busy schedule like yourself? Cause you've got four kids. So it's kind of like, when can we add it in during your day? And if you know, like, okay, I set time aside to run great, but we may also need to tweak that running schedule just a little bit for you in different personality types. So we've got some in here that I will almost like not red flag in my mind, but I'm like, I need to tell her to step back. Okay. Like, I really like, I know she's not going to want to hear this because people are like, I, I got to get out there. I got to lift and do this and work out and do all these things, which again, we don't want people to stop doing that. But there are so many people that are doing it and causing detrimental issues to their bodies, not just pelvic floor, that they, those aren't usually the sessions they love us. But then after a while, they're like, I really think I needed to hear that because now I'm pain-free and I'm going back up in weight and I feel like I'm going to PR again soon or whatever. Whereas some of my other patients need to push in the other way. I'm like, no, like, let's go to the gym. Let's go. Cause they'll be like, I'm just too scared. I had my baby, you know, a year ago. And I'm Don't like, I have to be fit. To yeah. Get in there? And I'm like, hold on. No, we need to get back out there. You need to get your body moving again and get blood flow, all that stuff. So it, it's not even just like, like you said, meeting the patient where their goal is or any kind of pelvic floor education, but it's just so much like, I feel like we work with just the person too. And sometimes it is the hard conversations too, of maybe at two months postpartum, they want to fit in a dress for a friend's wedding. And it's like, that's not the important piece here because we know that the running is causing the pressure down there. Like our goal is to really support you past that wedding time frame. We want to get you to six months postpartum and 12 months postpartum and two years postpartum without those same symptoms. So it is sometimes having the harder conversations, like take it slow. We didn't say you could stop, but maybe start out doing something for five minutes. And then maybe it's five minutes twice or three times a day. And then slowly building it back up instead of like, Hey, I just had a baby five days ago. I'm going to go outside for a 45 minute run. We're like, Ooh, it's going to be seeing you in the office real soon. Yeah. Oh, I feel like you too along with being physical therapists, are therapists for a lot of your patients. Postpartum, especially pregnancy, and also postpartum, I feel like there's so many, like at least during pregnancy, you have monthly appointments. So you have like times to kind of share what's on your mind, but then you move to postpartum. You've just had a baby. You've just been through labor and delivery. And all you have is this six week appointment, which now even a lot of people are doing virtually. My sister in law just had a baby and she was like, Yeah, I did mine virtually. I was like, I mean, not that I should judge since I haven't been to mine, but like, <laughs> but like oh, that like, was bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. But I just feel like virtual six week appointment feels even less helpful than having no <laughs> six week appointment. But I think we like, especially since this, these last 18 months, we've been their first checkup a lot of times for our vaginal and our cesarean where a couple of them we do have to send in because it just doesn't look healed because they've done too much or not done enough yet. It, there's just so much wrapped into pelvic floor health. Going back to what we talked about before, people being embarrassed to even think about it or not wanting to look at their pelvic floor. And I think especially after having a baby, there's all sorts of feelings about how your body looks and how it's functioning and feeling kind of broken and you're helping them to build back up. But I feel like you have to confront a lot too, like in that process as you're rebuilding these connections. Absolutely. And people want a quick fix and they want, you know, I can't tell you how many times a week I have patients being like, well, I, I give me a regimen. I want something to do, blah, 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 blah. And it is having those hard conversations. I'm like, let's start with what you feel like is realistic for you to get done so that we know instead of giving them 20 different things to focus on, because then they get home and like, I don't know what to do. And now I don't have time for any of it, but it's, it's almost taking a step back in their personal life and being like, it's okay that this is a season of life that I can't do all of these things right now. And that's really hard for a lot of our patients to, cause they come in here and they're like, well, they're going to give me all these things to do. And I, I want to be able to do them. But I can't tell you how many of them they're like, I just can't get to it this week. And I get that. I get that. But 
um, trying to be realistic, have them understand how to be realistic with themselves so that they understand why we are being realistic with them. Because sometimes I think they take it as a, well, maybe I'm just not there yet. Yeah. I love this idea of incorporating it into the movements you're already making. Because I know for me, I would be that person who is like, okay, yeah, this seems totally doable when I'm in the office of like 10 minutes of these exercises, 10 minutes of this. I remember after I had my twins being like, okay, if I just did one push up, which is probably like not a good thing to do, but like starting with one push up and I did that like every day that I could work up to this many push ups. And then like months later, I was like, okay. Well, Never did that one push up. Never did that, but, you know, in theory, I could have been doing a lot of push ups by now. <laughs> I do think I, I love this focus on how do you incorporate it into what you're already doing and maybe connecting, creating some mindfulness around the way your body is moving. Because I think that's another thing that gets disconnected for me. You're not even paying attention to your body because you're paying attention to so many other things. So I think some of these exercises can help you focus back in, be in the moment and be present with how you're feeling. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I saw on your website, you when I was thinking about like timing for all of this and you say you don't have to wait until your, you know, six week checkup. Do you have like a time when you feel like this is when patients mostly are like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to think about my pelvic floor health. We like to say two weeks and I, I go off at two weeks, I guess, because I remember coming home with a baby and depending on if you had a C-section, you're waiting for milk to come in and you're trying to get on that schedule. And at the same time, we want that pelvic floor to be healing. Things that we want to start working on would be like belly breathing, but really you should just be resting and not trying to be super mom in those first couple of weeks and hoping that the women have, we've seen them prenatally that they're kind of taking that advice. But a lot of them, honestly, if they've been our patient during pregnancy are texting us when their baby's delivered within the first like 48 hours. And then it's like, what can I do? And we're like, how was your delivery? This is how, what, what can I do? Okay. Let's get you on the schedule for like two weeks out and we'll talk then, but what can I be doing now? And I'm like, just snuggle that baby sister. That's all I really want you to do. Love on it. Get some oxytocin. Feel good. And then six weeks, in my opinion, and I'm sure Morgan is the same, like that's too long. Your body's already been probably moving inappropriately, compensating for a while of that nine month period. And then again, you're already moving that baby. So if we can start to connect the tissue earlier, we tend to see, you know, better outcomes with connecting the dots, then we're not seeing them as long. They're not coming in at nine months postpartum with issues. They're feeling pretty good. And we can get them back to their stress reliever or into mommy stroller, fitness classes, you know, whatever it is without them having the symptoms. Yeah. And like to her point, I really try to push people to come in during their pregnancy, even if it's more from like a wellness standpoint, um, especially my new moms who this is their first pregnancy to come in, just learn what is the pelvic floor? What's going on here? How can we talk about um, getting that perineal area to work like we should prior to delivery and through that labor and delivery piece of everything? Then once we see them during their pregnancy, and I mean, they'll come in for issues during their pregnancy too, not just wellness. Like Amanda said earlier, the, the, it just connects better afterwards. And then we're not starting from square one. We already had this base of like what my body was doing before, how it feels different now. And it's not as overwhelming because when they come in at two, four, six weeks, there's just, just like almost hysteria. Like, it's just like, oh my gosh, I have so much to learn and so much to do. And my body feels broken and, and we don't want people to feel that way, but if, you think about your body's about to go through this major event, whether you have a vaginal or cesarean delivery, why aren't we prepping the body? Why aren't we prehabbing it? And so that's what, what we like to kind of like think about when our patients who are pregnant come in, just like if you had a lot of hip pain and you were going to get a hip replacement surgery, a lot of times your surgeon will say, yep, we'll schedule the surgery for six weeks from now. In the meantime, go do a couple of physical therapy appointments so you know what your strength looks like. It's the same thing for having a baby. And I have not had a C-section, so I don't know what that recovery is like, but I understand that it is major abdominal surgery that is not treated like as such, but you know, you get your one, one extra day in the hospital or whatever it is and you're, and you're sent home. Like, how do you see that differently? Like whether you have a vaginal or a C-section, is it like 
two weeks in, you could come in or do you need to give yourself some more time with the C-section? It's the same thing. Like they're going to be compensating in the abdominal region. It's dealing with a little bit more inflammation in that area compared to a vaginal birth. If you had a vaginal tear, you need to be dealing with some more inflammation down there. And it's helping them get that inflammation out. So the healing process, you know, can help. And a lot of times they're like, why am I having pain? Why is it swollen here? Can I wear a belly binder? What can I be doing to help with this? Or they are, I've been wearing this belly binder 24 hours a day. And you're like, nope, let's readdress that. Uh, So what is your stance on a belly binder? I like them when patients are standing. So say you're washing bottles, prepping dinner. Hopefully you're not standing for like long lengths of time. Like standing for an hour is a long time on major abdominal surgery or vaginal surgery. But having that support there when you are getting up to like walk across the room with the baby or fold the laundry, I think is very beneficial. The thing that patients need to watch for is how tight are they tightening it? Because that can create pressure downwards, creating prolapse. And the same goes for baby wearing, because that's added pressure in the front. Like, how long are we doing it? How does it feel afterwards? I don't want my patients wearing the abdominal binder at like eight weeks postpartum. Usually by like four, six weeks, I'm, we're hopefully in here retraining the tissue and we can give them better guidance on it. But by like eight weeks, like toss that sucker out. Let's try to get those muscles working well for you again. So that's happening instead of us relying on garments. But there are some awesome supportive garments that we will still continue to have patients to purchase. Like um, some awesome biker shorts that like all of a sudden in the past couple of years, like now they're back in style. So people are like, oh yeah, I'll wear those. Where before it was like, you want me to wear what? Nobody would go purchase biker shorts. So this year has been really great in that one. We're just like, get supportive. Don't get, you know, thin ones that you can see through or the supportive leggings have been really beneficial too. And that's like ongoing is good to wear, not just. I like them trying to feel like, are you, do you find yourself pushing back against it? Because if that's the case, then we're creating that pressure out of the abdominal region coming out versus them connecting in. So it's really listening to your body and seeing like, how does it feel as I move throughout my day? Did I have a really rough day because maybe I went to Costco and was on my feet for an hour and then I had to go run a few more errands and then I can feel my belly pushing out like. That's probably too much, probably did too much that day. So it's not only paying attention to your pelvic floor, but also the abdominal region. And those garments are good during pregnancy as well. I had a patient in here this morning who is two years postpartum, but newly pregnant again. And she, her diastasis was, um, she had, I would say three finger. And so she was doing certain things and she's like, well, I never wore a belly band during my last pregnancy or postpartum. She's like two years out, I shouldn't have to wear one now. And I'm like, no, it's okay. You can still wear one, especially when you're going to the gym and doing more like high level activities. So like she was saying, eventually you want to not have to wear them during your daily activities. But there's a lot of times that I'll have patients, depending on the diastasis or pain or anything like that, I'll have them wear a band in the gym for months and months. And this is different than like a waist trainer. Yes. Way different than a waist trainer. Almost like a really nice leggings for for the butt belly. Yeah compression garment that's soft and stretchy. Well, let's talk about baby wearing for a minute because that's something I do a lot. How is that? Like, I totally get why that would be stressful. And what are some things to like think about if you do want to wear your baby right postpartum? We, what I usually talk to my patients about is getting on a wearing schedule. So kind of easing into it rather than like baby's here, I'm going to strap them on for six hours No, we're going to, you know, again, meeting the patient where they're at. Some of my patients can start with three to five minutes if they have prolapse issues. Some of them are, we're doing 20 minute, you know, spurts at the beginning and building up from there. Let's try to beat the symptoms before the symptoms start talking to you rather than it's like, oh my gosh, I wore my baby for three hours and I have all this pressure down there. Well, have you tried doing it for like an hour? No. Okay. Well then they do it. They're like, okay, an hour is fine. But now, now I, I realize when I get to that hour and a half mark, no good. So then getting them on a schedule appropriately, but then also teaching them about how their center of gravity has changed since their pregnancy, and then getting them to understand how to create more stability through their whole core system and their pelvic floor while they are asking their core to do such an endurance um, activity, such as standing and walking. 
because people are like, well, it should just be able to bounce back on. I'm like, sometimes your posture may only be good for three minutes and that's okay. Then we may need to like, okay, retrain. The more we add into it, the better. Like, so really retrain the posture piece. I want to say sometimes I know, I'm sitting up, I'm like, oh, I'm so slouchy. No, and it's hard, but posture is the hardest thing I teach. I don't believe that posture is this like cookie cutter. Here's a picture of what you should be standing like because our hips don't look the same. Our body compositions don't look the same. Our pelvic floors are not the same. So none of the patients that come in our clinic are the same. And so they're like, oh, I saw this thing on Instagram. I'm like, but you have this going on too. So let's like, it's very individual based and it should be really segmentally looked at, like what's going on with your neck and the ribs and then the hips and all of this. And then we'll add the baby. This just made me think. So when someone comes in and you are giving them like pelvic floor, you do an evaluation, but are you then giving advice about all parts of their body? Absolutely. Yeah. I was thinking about like my back and my posture and like you were talking about hips. What kind of assessment are you doing when someone first comes in? I would say it's different per therapist too. Like the different clinics do things different ways, but we look at everything. We look at everything, especially again, because they may come in here one visit without their baby. And then we know they've had a baby. So we know how they look in here without a baby is going to be way different than when they carry a baby. So we're, if they don't bring a baby in, we're typically handy. Like how much does your baby weigh? Okay. I'm going to give you this weight because Ours are on like 5, 8, 10, 12 pound range up to 30 plus. Your baby's 8 pounds. Okay, I'm going to go 5 pounds. Let's look at how you're walking, carrying your baby up here on your shoulder, left and right. How does it look if we give you the weight of your car seat down low? And you can see a heck of a lot. When we're just going to go for like, let's see if we can go for a minute, walking for a minute. Because that's like walking from the baby's room through the kitchen, living room, yada, yada, yada. And most patients, their posture is changing before that minute is up. When you go from like, okay, I'm going to be up nice and tall, carrying my baby to, oh, oh, now we're leaning back and now I can totally feel it in my spine, you know, up a little bit higher. And we're like, okay, let's go ahead and fix that posture again. Okay, let's go again. Oh, you know, 10 seconds later, I'm leaning back again. And that's the very similar thing that we see when we're baby wearing because you've got extra weight back out here. So your body starts to shift. And it's just for them to notice and kind of recognize, like, I'm feeling that shift. I'm going to readjust. I'm going to see if I can go again. Oh, I feel the shift again. I'm going to readjust. And usually by the third time, we're like, okay, that means like take a break, sit down or put a foot up on a step stool if you're at the sink washing dishes while you've got baby, something to give your back a break. Or then that's like, that's our cutoff for that week. And write that down. And then tomorrow, see if you can go that time again. And if things are going good, maybe add a minute. And that's how we're going to start to build up the endurance. It's like a running and walking program, but for your core. Absolutely. And my, and my husband calls uh, me a creep. And the reason is, is because I, we can't help but look at the way people move and stand because of what we do all day. And so for you, it's probably like, man, you were like, are constantly analyzing what the patients are doing. And it, it's absolutely that. So that, cause then once you bring awareness to someone, Again, the per- it depends on the person. Some people are like, I never noticed that. Or some people become hyper aware hyper. of it. And it's like, whoa, probably shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> now, now we just created a little bit of a paranoia around that issue. We are constantly looking at people's movement patterns and, and everywhere in their body because it can be just such a subtle change that needs to happen that can create this like you know, domino effect on their body. Which secretly is so hard if we're like traveling. Like say you're at the airport. And yeah. you, I mean, we're watching every so said, mom. We're creeps. Yes. Because you're like, ooh, if I, should I say something? Should I not? Should yeah. I, you know, how I want to yeah. help her, but ugh, that lady's hip has to hurt. I'm telling you right line. now. <laughs> a little adjustment. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's just move it right here. I think you should feel good for a little bit longer. No, that's amazing. Well, I know we're like running short on time and I could talk to you guys all day, but if someone isn't sure about pelvic floor PT or they're just feeling kind of hesitant or embarrassed or anything like what would you say to that new mom or dad I mean I know you treat men and women in that postpartum period to kind of encourage them to take the first step just do it um (laughs) or go on our Instagram and ask us a question we love answering people's questions especially we do wellness Wednesday they can ask questions because I think that fear or anxiety people have that they want to know what's going to happen 
just ask. Uh, and we get questions a lot like, hey, I'm going to go see this person. They don't do internal. Okay, well, these are some questions you might want to ask them, or you might want to find a therapist that does internal. Or um, a, a big question right now is like, well, my therapist doesn't take insurance. Sometimes those are the best therapists because they don't have to work in the guidelines of insurance companies. I would say do it for your health, number one, but don't be afraid to ask somebody what and ask multiple people like what's going on. This morning, I got asked the question like, well, where do I find one? And I'm like, first, Google your region and see what therapists are in your area. Then you can go to like, hermanandwallace.com or pelvicguru.com and see, are these guys certified in certain classes? Because you can see, then I would probably stick with one of those and be like, okay, now I'm going to pick out of those websites and see who I'm going to go to. And then go back to Google and creep on the reviews. Reviews tell a lot about the clinic itself, the therapist in there. So hopefully that can start to ease their mind. But like nowadays you can creep on PTs on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I mean, how fantastic is that? So you can start to like know, oh, Morgan's got a dog. Oh, she's so cute. And oh, she's married. And oh, her house is adorable. She's such a good decorator. Like they start to come in here already. Morgan's their best friend. So then they feel already that like, know, and trust factor. And they're like, do whatever you want to my pelvic floor. Let's fix this baby. And it's much easier, I think, for us. We like save a couple visits because we've already connected with them from social media. No, totally agree with that. And I feel like once they come in after that first time, you can just see that anxiety come down. They're coming in. They seem like a whole new person that second time. But I think the biggest thing though is we are just so passionate about telling people about this because we have so many people coming in now from social media or from their friends. And hearing it from someone like that, you're way more likely to go do it than if your doctor just slaps this referral in front of you. And it's like, maybe try them out. I don't know where they are. I don't know who they are. It's like, yeah, probably not going to come. And actually like our doctors now, they, when they give them the referral, it's not go see them. It's, hey, here they are on Instagram. Check them out there first. Here's the script when you're ready. And we are hearing that so much more too, which I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. Like, I really like that. And then they're typically messaging us on there too. That's awesome. Well, I, as I said at the top, your Instagram is amazing. It's so, you guys pack so much information into a really entertaining, like 30 second minute. So <laughs> I think I highly cool. recommend heading there because I think it demystifies a lot of this. You know, this is important and you're, but you're not like taking it too seriously. So be, people can ask questions and like be a part of it. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you so much again. And we'll, I'll make sure to include everything in the show notes, but could you just share your Instagram? It sounds like that's probably the best place to start. I mean, your website is great too. It has online offerings and virtual consults. Yes. Yep. A lot of our online programs are on our website at empoweryourpelvis.com. Um, our blog is on there too. So if you want to really just get some free content, you can go to that. We have our pelvic posse email listserv. So if you really want more content, the email public posse is really great. And then our Instagram is empower.your.pelvis. And we're very active on there. Trying to get more active on TikTok. It's the same name. For sure. Well, thank you so much again. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to thank chat. Thank you so much thank for having you. us. We, we love this. It. Yes. Today We Tried is brought to you by Kalugo, a baby gear brand founded by parents for parents. I'm your host, Christy, and our producer is Mike Pilak. Stay tuned for more. And in the meantime, remember, you got this and we've got you.